Alright, so we're going to start today off with the lecture on chapter one. This is just a picture of the textbook in case I, I didn't include one with the syllabus so you know which textbook you're looking for. Alright, so chapter one, we jump right in and start talking about what is chemistry. Well, chemistry is really it's the study of, of stuff. It's the study of matter, okay? Um, and stuff and according to the textbook, is matter. And matter is anything that takes up space, or in other words, has volume, and it also has mass, okay? It has to have both in order to be matter. It has, takes up space and it has mass, all right? So all of these pictures here are examples of different types of matter. Solid brick, a beer, a balloon full of air, all of those things have volume, take up space, and have mass. Um, the balloon is one I like to point out. A lot of people think so mass and weight are kind of similar, kind of the same things. And you think of a helium balloon, which floats. So it doesn't really have weight because it floats. But it does have mass, okay? Um, and, and let me sort of show you the difference between mass and weight like this example. So mass is the amount of matter in a substance, okay? Um, on Earth, we often talk about it as weight um, because it's a measurement that we can take. We can take, we can measure weight as a way of measuring the mass of something. The difference between weight and mass is that mass is constant. It is fixed. I have a given mass um, and that doesn't matter if I'm underwater or if I'm on the moon or if I'm standing right here in front of the classroom, my mass is the same. It's the amount of stuff that I'm made up of doesn't change, okay? However, my weight does. If I'm standing here in the classroom, I weigh, you know, let's say 100 pounds, okay? This guy. Um, if I go and jump into a swimming pool, the water, the buoyancy, sort of counteracts my weight, and I weigh less. If I go to the moon, the gravity there is different, so I weigh even less on the moon. My weight changes, okay, but my mass does not. I'm still the same amount of person. It's a constant thing. Um, but on Earth, a lot of times we talk about mass, we measure mass in terms of weight, but they are different. And helium on Earth, in this, in the space of other air that's uh, less, or that's more dense, helium floats, okay? But it still has mass. It still has matter. It still has molecules that take up space um, and, and have a, an actual mass that can be measured, okay? So when we're talking about mass, when we talk about different types of measurements in chemistry, um, all of those different uh, measurements have units. So volume in chemistry, we are usually talking about liters. There's other ways in the world that we measure volume. Um, in the United States, a lot of times, ounces, fluid ounces. But in chemistry, we always use liters or milliliters or some other liter-based um, measurement. So these different prefixes, this is just a table from your book if you can't see it clearly in the video, of different metric prefixes. So the standard unit of measurement in science is SI units, the international units. Um, liters for volume and grams for mass. These are much more convenient to use mathematically than a lot of the units we use in the U.S because they all are multiples of 10. So you can convert grams into milligrams or kilograms very easily by multiplying or dividing by 1,000. Whereas in um, American units like pounds, converting pounds to ounces is, is much more difficult. It's not um, even multiples of 10. So metric system is actually much easier to use. So just remember that in volume, the, the SI unit is liters, and for mass, the SI unit is grams. Alright, um, so a big important thing 
in chemistry is math, unfortunately. And a lot of you may not have a strong math background, so we try to keep it somewhat simple in this class, and I try to really walk you through it, and there's some extra math help in the, in the textbook as well. But unit conversions are a type of math that are key in chemistry. You can't really call yourself a chemistry student if you can't do unit conversions. I mean, that's maybe a little harsh, but it is really important in the sciences. And will be important in, if you're going into nursing in pharmacology, doing conversions for drugs. Uh, it's also helpful in like the kitchen sometimes, or it, we live really close to Canada a lot of times. Um, temperature conversions from Celsius to Fahrenheit, uh, or speed conversions from kilometers per hour, miles per hour. These are all forms of unit conversion, okay? Converting one unit of volume or mass or speed or whatever into another unit. Um, and it's actually very simple. It's a there's a procedure to it, and once you learn the procedure, you can do it for any type of unit conversion. So a simple example we're going to walk through here. Uh, we want to know how many milliliters are in a two-liter bottle of soda. So imagine you're given a two-liter bottle of soda, and someone says, how many milliliters is this? Okay. So essentially, we are uh, the way we need to start this is to figure out, well, how many milliliters are in one liter? In, in a liter, how many milliliters are there? And <clears throat> this is what is called an equivalency. One liter is equal to a thousand milliliters. That is an equivalency. This is equal to that. All right, we can take this equivalency and turn it into something called a conversion factor. Essentially, we turn the equivalency into a fraction that we can use in a math problem. Okay? So we can either say that there's one liter per 1,000 milliliters. You can think of that division line as like per, okay? One liter per 1,000 milliliters. Or you could also say that there's 1,000 milliliters per one liter. You could use either of these. And when we do the math problem, you'll see that sometimes this is the appropriate conversion factor to use, and sometimes this is the appropriate conversion factor to use. A lot of you have probably already done this problem in your head because it's simple. But we're going to keep going and talk about how to properly do unit conversions. <clears throat> All right, when you're, this sort of formula for a unit conversion is this. The given unit, which is liters, because we are given a two liter bottle, okay, we're given two liters, um, and we want to convert it into milliliters, so our desired unit is what we're converting it to, milliliters. So we want to set up the problem with our given unit, what we're given, over a, or multiplied by a conversion factor that has the desired unit on top and the given unit on the bottom. So what our, pro, our, our equation's actually going to look like is this. We're given two liters, all right? And the conversion factor we're going to use is this one because it has our desired unit of milliliters on top. So two liters times 100 or 1,000 milliliters over one liter is equal to 2,000 milliliters. And notice the importance of having the conversion factor in the proper arrangement is because we want our liters, our original unit, to cancel out. You have liters on top and liters on bottom, and now they cancel out, so the unit that you're left with is milliliters. Your answer is going to be in milliliters, okay? But we're going to work a couple more of these. So this is when we're going to work together, all right? It's a little bit trickier. Um, an adult male with a mass of 185 pounds weighs how many kilograms? And we're given this equivalency. One pound is equal to 0.454 kilograms, right? So the first thing we're gonna, I would like you to do is to write out what the two conversion factors are from that equivalency, all right? I'll give you a second to do that. All right, the conversion, the two conversion factors you can make. All right, so one is going to look like this: one pound over zero point four five four kilograms, and the other will be like this: point four five four kilograms per 
one pound. All right? These are the two conversion factors that we can get from that equivalency. All right, now we need to set up our problem, our unit conversion problem. Um, an adult male with a mass of 185 pounds weighs how many kilograms? <clears throat> so we want to set it up as our given unit uh, times our conversion factor, which is going to be our desired unit over our given unit. Okay, so what are we given? We're given that a guy weighs 185 pounds. All right, and we're going to use which conversion factor here? We're going to multiply that by which conversion factor? This one? Nope. We're going to do this one because our desired unit, we want to know how many kilograms he weighs. So we want kilograms on top. Another way to think about it is we want our pounds to cancel out, so we want pounds to be on bottom. Okay, over one pound. Pound. All right? So now our pounds cancel out, and I should leave my units in here. This is 0.454 kilograms. So now our answer in kilograms is what? I don't have a calculator on me. So your answer was 83.99 kilograms. You are correct. So I have this worked out on the slide in front of you. But I wanted to work it out manually. Okay? <clears throat> All right. So given unit over desired unit. There we go. 83.99 kilograms is the answer to that. <clears throat> so there's more of those problems in the book and the homework. Work through some more unit conversion problems. You will see them consistently throughout the course, particularly in the first third, first half of the course is actually where a lot of the math is. Um, but that's as really as difficult as it gets. We're going to do some more unit conversions in, later in the chapter when we talk about temperature conversions from Fahrenheit to Celsius to Kelvin, which is another unit. Um, but first we're going to talk about the different states of matter. So we're talking about matter. Matter is anything that has volume and mass, okay? Um, and there's three different states. Of, well, there's actually four different states, but there's three that we're going to talk about in this class. Solid, liquid, and gas. Each of these different states of matter has different characteristics that define them. A solid is defined by a type, state of matter that has a defined amount of space, a defined volume, and it has a defined shape. Okay, so this brick, it, it is in a square, a rectangular shape, okay, um, and it has a certain volume that you can't change it. If you try to, you can't break it, you can't fold it, you can't, you know, turn it into, it's, a brick is a brick, it's solid. That's because the molecules, the individual little atoms within that brick, are solidly sort of they're they're um, sort of rigidly they move a little bit like they wiggle around but they really aren't moving much they are pretty stationary and that gives this brick solid fixed shape and a fixed volume <clears throat> when it comes to liquids the molecules if you zoom in on a on a glass of water the molecules are actually they're kind of moving around they're jostling around kind of slowly okay. But they're still moving. Um, let's see, I think I have an animation on this. Yes, there we go. Okay. I don't know if you can see that very well in the video. But the solid molecules, they're kind of moving a little bit. The liquid molecules, they're bouncing around, but just kind of slowly, kind of chill, but they're, they're floating around. That gives liquids a certain fluidity. So they do have a fixed volume. But they don't have a fixed shape. They have a flexible shape. That's why you could take this beaker of water, you could pour it into another container. You'd still have the same volume of water, but it would have a different shape. It takes on the shape of whatever container you put it in because it's flexible, because the molecules are moving around a little bit. It helps keep them flexible. Now, when it comes to gases, those molecules are flying around like crazy. They're not really interacting with each other at all. They are flying around all over the place. 
which means gives gas both a flexible shape and a flexible volume. So you take this balloon and you could, uh, we'll talk about different ways that we can change the volume of it by changing the pressure or the temperature. Um, and you can also change the shape. You can take that balloon and you could squish it into different shapes, you know, when they make those balloon animals, okay? So gas can change shape, it has flexible shape, and it has a flexible volume because the, pu the particles are so full of movement. <clears throat> All right? And because gases are very, they are, are flexible both in volume and shape, um, they have classically been the state of matter that has been most examined, most experimented on to uh, study the behavior of matter in response to different stimuli. And the two that we're going to talk about are the response of gas to both pressure and to temperature and a couple of laws uh, surrounding it. So first we're going to talk about pressure. What is pressure? Um, and the units of pressure. So we already talked about the SI units for volume being liters the SI units for mass being in grams. All right, the units for pressure, there's two different units that are used commonly. Um, one is pounds per square inch, PSI. So oftentimes we use, you see PSI on tires, like bike tires, car tires, you want to fill to a certain pressure, and it gives you that pressure in PSI. Another unit for measuring pressure is millimeters of mercury. Uh, millimeters of HG. HG is the chemical symbol for mercury. So that one you use, you see a lot in terms of atmospheric pressure when you're measuring uh, barometric pressure like weather, weather channel stuff. So um, both of them are used maybe equally commonly, I'm not sure. Atmospheric pressure is 760 millimeters of mercury. See if I can move this out of the way a little bit. 700, 760 millimeters of mercury, or it can be measured in PSI as 14.7 PSI. That is the pressure of the atmosphere pushing down on the Earth, okay? Either one of these. So we could actually say that this is an equivalency here. We could turn this into an equivalency. We can say 14.7 PSI is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. And we can then convert this equivalency into conversion factors. All right, what would those conversion factors be? I'll write them over here. 14.7 PSI over 760 millimeters of mercury, or vice versa, 760 over 14.7. So if we wanted to, if we were given some measurement that, you know, the bike pressure, your pr the tire pressure in your bike tire needs to be, I don't, I don't know what they should be, 25 PSI, okay, 80 PSI. I think I have a road bike that I haven't ridden in like two years, and I think it's supposed to be 80 PSI, okay? Um, so I could ask you, what is that pressure in millimeters of mercury? And you would have to convert it using one of those conversion factors. Um, and there's probably some homework problems in your book that ask you to do that. Okay, just trying to sneak in a little conversion, unit conversion math um, into this slide. Alright, so pressure and volume when it comes to gases are related. And there was this guy, a scientist, a chemist in the early days, who his name was Boyle. Um, and he figured out that pressure and volume are directly, that they're, that they're proportional. So if you change, if you do something to the pressure, you do the exact same thing to the volume, but invert it. I'm not explaining that well. So Boyle's, Boyle came up with a law. He did a bunch of experiments, and he came up with a law that said the volume of a fixed amount of gas at constant temperature is inversely proportional to the pressure. This is how you express that law mathematically. Pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume. Um, that's what this little symbol here means. It means proportional to the inverse of the volume, one over the volume. Okay, so what does that mean? This is a, a sort of visual example here. So you have a syringe. Let's say you have a syringe, and you fill it with air. You pull the, 
the pump, you fill it with air, and then you put a cap on the end. So now it's closed on both ends, that air is trapped in there, and there's a certain pressure that's exerted by the walls of the syringe and the piston, etc. Okay? Now you take your finger and you depress that piston, and you reduce, you, you add twice as much pressure. Okay, now you're putting twice as much pressure on the gas. What happens to it? The volume becomes half. All right, so if you double the pressure, you have the volume. One over two is half the volume, okay? If you add three times as much pressure, and I don't like this picture because it makes it look like two-thirds of the volume. Really, it should be half the volume, okay? If you triple the pressure, you add three times as much pressure on that piston, you're going to decrease the volume by one-third. Three times as much pressure, one-third of the volume. Okay? See how that's working? So there's actually a formula for determining the changes in pressure or volume on a gas in a situation, and that is called Boyle's Law. And this is the, the mathematical formula for Boyle's Law. This may look a little scary for some people, but it's actually really quite simple, and I'll walk you through it. The equation is PI times VI equals PF times VF. Also, sometimes I'll say P1, V1 versus P2, V2. I don't know if I find it easier to say that way. Either thing, I'm talking about the same thing. I stands for initial, and F stands for final. So what it's saying is you have some scenario. Initially, you start out, for example, initially you start out with this syringe that has a given volume and a given pressure, and now you're going to change something. You're going to add pressure, or you're going you're to change the pressure or the volume in some way, and you want to know how the other factor is changing. If you change the pressure, what's going to happen to the volume? So initially you have some scenario, you change it, and you want to know what the outcome is going to be. You use this equation, okay? So uh, let's walk through an example. Um, oh, and mathematically, let's, so let's say you have a starting pressure of something. Um, you're given the starting pressure and volume, and you're given the final pressure, but you want to solve for the final, so you want to know what the final volume is. You can rearrange this equation so that you're solving for VF. That's a really good way, if, you're, if you have decent algebra skills, that's a good way to start the problem, is to actually rearrange the equation to solve for the factor that you're looking for. So my question here is, how would you rearrange this equation to solve for VF? Well, you want VF to be alone on one side of the equal sign. So you really want to get rid of this PF. You want to move it to the other side of the equation. How do you do that? You multiply both sides by 1 over PF. You multiply both sides by 1 over PF. Okay? Then it cancels out on this side. And what you're left with on this side is PI times VI over PF. I'll write it in here. All right? Equals VF. If that was a little too much for you, we'll do it again on the next slide. All right? Well, in a couple of slides when we do a practice problem. So the cool thing about Boyle's Law, to sort of bring it back to health, because that's really the point of this class, is to learn about chemistry in relation to health sciences and, and to see sort of that connection so that then you'll be able to apply it in your health science class and potentially your health science career. All right? Boyle's Law is actually how the lungs work. So most people know that the diaphragm is this large muscle under the lungs, all right, that expands and contracts and helps to change the volume, pump the lungs, all right? But it's not actually a pumping action of the diaphragm that causes breathing. That diaphragm expansion and contraction leads to change, changes in the volume of the lungs. And when you change the volume of the lungs, you change the pressure. So in this scenario, when you're inhaling, okay, the diaphragm contracts, it gets smaller, so it pulls down on the lungs, and the lungs expand. Their volume increases. If their volume is increasing, 
it means that their pressure is decreasing. The air pressure in the lungs decreases, which causes air to be sucked in. It causes like a vacuum sort of effect. Conversely, when the diaphragm relaxes and expands, the lungs contract. They get smaller, so all the air in there it becomes pressurized, and therefore high pressure air wants to leave to go to a place of lower pressure outside, so you exhale. Okay? That's how breathing works. It's through Boyle's Law. <clears throat> Alright, so here's our first uh, a sample problem that we're going to work. I can't remember if I have it worked out. Nope, I'm going to work it manually. Alright? So, this is a Boyle's Law practice problem. The lungs of a normal adult can hold about 5 liters of air under typical pressure, under typical atmospheric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury. If a cliff diver dives to a depth where the water pressure is 950 millimeters of mercury, what will the volume of his lungs be? All right, this is a Boyle's Law problem. Whenever we are doing a problem that has some kind of equation like Boyle's Law, the first thing we should do is write out what that law is, what the equation is. So I'm going to go ahead and write out P1 times V1 equals P2 times V2. Or you could write PIVI equals PFVF, either one. All right? Um, and I'm going to make a little chart over here to record our values that we're given. Because organization... Organizing these math problems is very important. And I'm not very good at organizing them in my head. I like to organize them on paper. But let's go through. What are we starting with? Well, we're starting with what we're told a normal adult volume of lung volume is in normal atmospheric pressure. Okay? So our P1, our pressure 1, our initial pressure, is 760 millimeters of mercury. Shoot. And we'll start over here. Our P1 is 760 millimeters of mercury. Our V1 is 5 liters, the normal volume of the lungs. Our P2, um, we're told, that we're, we're asked what is the volume of the lungs at 950 millimeters of mercury. So 950 is our P2. And our V2 is a question mark. That's the X that we're solving for, okay? So there's two different ways you could work this algebraically. I'll write out the equation here. We could just go ahead and plug in what we have and solve for X that way. P1 equals 760 millimeters of mercury times V1, which is 5 liters, equals P2, which is 950 millimeters of mercury. Good idea to copy this down into your notes, this math problem that I'm solving for you. All right, and V2, we don't know. That's our X. That's what we're going to solve for. So some people prefer to just work with the numbers. You can multiply this, 760 times 5 liters. Shoot, I don't have a calculator. All right, we're going to pull one up on my computer. Um, while you guys pull yours up on your cell phones, probably. Okay, so 760 times 5. 760 times 5 equals 3,800. So 3,800 equals 950 times x. All right, think of V2 as x. And now, to solve for x, we divide both sides by 950. All right. So it cancels out on that side. So 3,800 divided by 950 is 4. If you get something different, let me know. X equals 4 in this problem. 4 liters, I should say. You should always keep our units. 
which I did not do in this problem. Um, this is millimeters of mercury. And this is millimeters of mercury times liters. So our millimeters are, our, um, our pressures are going to cancel out, so we're left with our volume. Volume is in liters, so 4 liters is what we just solved for. So that's one way to do it. The other way is to, is to isolate V2 from the start to rearrange this equation so that you get V2 equals P1 times V1 over P2. You do the algebraic rearrangement, and you can go ahead and then you plug in your numbers, and then you just do the math, and you've already solved for V2. Either way, you can rearrange it first, then plug in the numbers, or you can plug in the numbers and then solve for V2 that way. Either way is correct. Um, and if you ha are having trouble with the, uh, with the math, ask me after class, ask me in office hours, practice at home, ask your classmates, okay? Um, I can only have time to work a limited number of problems in class, but hopefully this was helpful. All right, so that's pressure. Boyle was the one who looked at pressure in volume with gas. But um, gases also change in response to temperature. And the guy who figured that out was named Charles, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So temperature affects the motion of gas particles. That's why it changes the volume of it. Um, when you add heat, the particles move faster. It's called Brownian motion, okay? Increasing heat increases the speed at which those particles are jumping around. Remember, we showed that on the other slide. If you remove heat, you cool something, um, then the particles move more slowly, all right? So, um, there's different, also when it comes to temperature, we have to talk about the units of temperature, and there's three different units of temperature, because there's three different temperature scales. The first one is Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is really only used by Americans. It's really only used in this country. Celsius is the one that's used. That is the really the SI unit, the standard international unit that the rest of the world uses. And Kelvin is a third temperature scale that's only really used by chemists. I shouldn't even say scientists because chemists are really the only ones who use it. And you'll see in some of um, the equations, Kelvin is the one that we have to use for Charles' law. So there's different conversion equations to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius and Celsius to Fahrenheit and Kelvins to Celsius, etc. Okay? These equations, you do have to know how to use them, and we will use them in a slide or two in a practice problem. You do not have to memorize the equations, even for tests. I will provide these equations for you. They are provided on the formula table in the back of your book, which is what I will provide for the test. So you don't have to memorize these equations, but you do have to be able to use them in a problem to do a temperature conversion. All right, so before we do temperature conversions, we're going to look at each of these different scales. This is a figure from your book that you should know by heart. Um, you should know the freezing point and boiling point of water on each of these three different scales, okay? And also the normal body temperature on each of these three different scales. So these three scales are related to each other in different ways. They all measure temperature, so they're all related in that way. Um, Celsius and Kelvin are interesting because they're really kind of the same thing. They're just offset by 273 degrees. So look here. On the, Kel on the Celsius scale, uh, the freezing point of water is 0 degrees. The boiling point is 100 degrees, okay? There's a 100 degree difference between those two points on the scale. If you come over here to Kelvin, freezing point of water is 273K, and the boiling point is 373K. Still, 100 degrees difference between those two points. What that means is that Celsius and uh, one Celsius degree and one Kelvin, we don't talk about Kelvin degrees for some reason, we just talk about Kelvins. So one Celsius degree is the same size as one Kelvin degree. 
the scales are just offset by 273, a factor of 273. So they're very similar, Celsius and Kelvin. Whereas Celsius, Celsius and Fahrenheit are different. They're very different. One Fahrenheit degree is not the same size as one Celsius degree. So you look here, 32 degrees is the freezing point of water versus 212 degrees, which is the boiling point of water. That's a difference of 180 degrees, correct? Yeah, 180 degrees, whereas from this point here, it's 100 degrees, okay? That means that one Celsius degree is actually 1.8 Fahrenheit degrees, so the size of the degrees are different. And if you look at one of the things I like about this figure, you probably can't see it on your screen, but if you look at your notes or the figure in your book, the tick marks on the, on the thermometers are different sizes for Fahrenheit and for Celsius. But Celsius and Kelvin, the tick marks are the same size because the degrees are the same size, okay? So let's do uh, a natural math problem here. Let's do some unit conversion. Um, we're going to convert. Uh, so on a hot summer day in Georgia, which is actually where I'm from, I grew up in Atlanta, the thermometer often rises as high as 102 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is true, unfortunately. I think this summer they reached record highs of 106 with that, the heat wave that we're having. So anyway, we want to convert 102 degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius and to Kelvins. So let's, when we're converting something, usually we want the thing we're looking for to be isolated, the unit we're looking for to be isolated on one side of the equal sign. So if we go back to that equation page, the conversion page, you can also look in, the, in your textbook, okay? We want to convert Fahrenheit to Celsius. So we want to know what Celsius. We're looking for Celsius. That's what we're looking for. So this is the equation we want to use. We want Celsius, degrees Celsius, to be isolated on one side of the equation. So this is the equation that we're going to use. Let me memorize it. Or, okay, so... Minus 32 over 1.8. Sorry, bad handwriting there. All right, so this is the equation. Um, so we're just going to plug in our numbers. So we're solving for Celsius. Our Fahrenheit is 102 degrees minus 32 over 1.8. Here I am. I'm going to pick up my, bring up my calculator again here on my computer. You guys can bring it up on your calculator or your cell phone and plug in the numbers yourself. So I'm going to plug in 102 minus 32 which happens to equal 70 and now I'm going to take 70 and divide that by 1.8. All right, do you see what I'm doing here? Following along. And the answer I get is 38.88. 38 I'm going to say 38.9. I'm just going to round it. All right. There is a, a part of this chapter that we're not going over that talks about significant figures, which are important in chemistry, but aren't really important in terms of, you know, the, the math that you're going to be using in anatomy, physiology, and pharmacology, et cetera. So I'm skipping that part, so don't worry about the section on significant figures, okay? Um, so 38.88, 38.9, okay, degrees Celsius, I should write my Celsius, is the conversion there, okay? Um, you can also double check your math a lot of times by using a little bit of common sense. So something like that, that I use, that I reference, I remember that, um, what the normal body temperature is, okay, that's something I want you to know on each scale, normal body temperature, for Fahrenheit, 98.6 degrees. Normal body temperature in Celsius, 37 degrees, okay? So 102 degrees is a little bit more than normal body temperature in Fahrenheit, which is 98.6 degrees. Okay, so that's like a high fever, all right? And 37 degrees Celsius is the equivalent of body temperature. So uh, our conversion, our answer should be a little bit higher than 37 degrees. And it is, 38.9, a little higher than 37. So we've done this correctly. Now we want to convert Fahrenheit, this Fahrenheit, 
temperature into Kelvin. So let's go back to our, um, our, conver our conversion equations. All right. Well, hmm. We don't have an equation that directly converts Fahrenheit to Kelvin. Because the only equation we have for Kelvin is converting Celsius to Kelvin. Well, good thing we just converted our Fahrenheit degrees to Celsius. So now we can use this equation. Kelvin is really easy once you know Celsius degrees. Because Kelvin is simply Celsius degrees plus 273. Pretty easy math problem, okay? So in, to get this temperature in Kelvin, we just have to take 38.9 degrees Celsius plus 273. So our answer is, I should probably be able to do this in my head, but I'm not good at head math. So 38.9 plus 273 equals 311.9. Hopefully you all got the same answer. 311.9 K for Kelvin. Okay? That was simple enough. Once, if you have the equations in front of you, all you have to do is what we call in math plug and chug. You plug in your numbers, you chug away in your calculator or on the side of your paper adding it up. Okay? So now back to gases and temperature and how temperature affects gas volume. Okay? So this guy Charles, Charles being his last name, I don't know his first name, um, notice that when you increase the temperature of a gas, you actually also you also increase the temperature or you also increase the volume of the gas. Okay? So he noticed that temperature and volume of gas are directly proportional. Meaning that whatever you do to the temperature, you directly do to the volume. Um, for instance, in this example over here, you take this gas, which is a temperature of 200, okay? You double, and a volume of one liter. If you double the temperature, you turn it up to 400 K, you also double the volume. It now becomes two liters of gas. It, 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 the gas actually expands in response to the added temperature because now the particles are pushing around, they're moving around faster, they're actually exerting more pressure, so they're going to expand. All right. So the equation to solve Charles' law, to solve problems using Charles' law, the equation for Charles' law is as such, very similar to Boyle's law, but now we've got T's instead of P's. All right. VI over TI equals VF over TF or V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, all right? The key with Charles's law is that temperature, when we are doing units of temperature, it has to be in kelvins. So if it's not given to you in kelvins, you need to first convert it into kelvins, which is some of the hardest math I'll ask you to do. Sort of a two-part problem. Converting, doing a conversion into kelvin so that you can then plug it in to this formula here. All right, so um, you could do problems, like I said before, by rearranging the equation first to solve for what you're looking for, or you could just plug numbers in and solve it that way. Um, so for those of you who have, good, have taken algebra and have solid algebra skills, you might want to go ahead and practice rearranging the equation to solve, for example, for final volume. But... Otherwise, we're going to go ahead and move on and just do a problem, a practice problem. Okay, this one's from your book. You can follow along in your notes or in your book. And again, we're going to work this one out manually. All right, so make sure you write down what I'm writing down so you can do this again later on your own. All right, if a balloon has a volume of 105 milliliters in the freezer, determine its volume if it is removed from the freezer, okay? So let's, let's just think about what's going to happen here first before we actually do the math, all right? We have a balloon of a certain volume. We put it in the freezer. We're cooling it down. Do you think the volume is going to increase or decrease? Right, it's going to decrease, okay, because we're cooling it down. The molecules are going to move more slowly, and they'll become a little compressed, okay? So 
Um, we should expect the volume to be less, or sorry, we expect it to be less in the freezer, but I'm just rereading the problem, and it says, determine its volume if it is removed from the freezer and warmed up. So in that case, we're expecting it to expand, okay? So our equation here, V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2, all right? So what is our initial volume? The volume, if a balloon has a volume of 105 milliliters in the freezer, Determine its volume if it is removed from the freezer, which is zero degrees, and warmed to 145 degrees. So initially, we're saying it's in the freezer. And the volume when it's in the freezer is 105 milliliters. The temperature in the freezer is what? It's zero degrees Celsius. Zero degrees Celsius. But wait, we need to have our temperature for this problem in Kelvin. So how do we convert from Celsius to Kelvin? We have to add 273 degrees. So what is 0 plus 273? It's 273. Okay? 273 Kelvin is our temperature. Now it's saying that we remove it from the freezer, and it wants to know what the volume is going to be. So that's a question mark. Um, I'll make little arrows instead of equal signs, all right? And the temperature that we're warming it to is 145 degrees Fahrenheit. But again, we need this to be in Kelvin for the problem to work, for the math to work properly. So we need to convert this into Kelvin. So we have to, to do that. Remember, there's no direct way to convert Fahrenheit to Kelvin. We have to convert it to Celsius first. So that equation was this. Okay, so in other words, 145 minus 32 over 1.8. So pull out your calculator, see if you can beat me to the answer. You probably already have 145 minus 32 equals 113, and 113 divided by 1.8. 8 equals 62.777. I'm going to just say 63. All right. 63 degrees Celsius. All right. So to convert this to Kelvin, we then have to do what? Add 273 degrees. So 63 plus 273, I'm going to do this manually, is going to be 6. 7 plus 6 is 13, carry the 1, 336 Kelvin, 336 Kelvin. So I'm going to write here that this is actually 336 Kelvin, okay? 145 degrees Fahrenheit is 336 Kelvin. So now we have all our numbers. We can solve for V2, what the final volume is. So I'm going to plug it in a little more clearly here. So we have 105 milliliters over 273 K kelvins over V2, which is our X, um, or sorry, it was V2, which is our X over 336 K. All right, and now we need to solve for X, solve for V2. So we need to um, <clears throat> uh, multiply both sides by 336. multiply both sides by 336, then it cancels out on this side and we're left with just V2, right? So now we plug all this into our calculator. 336 times 105 divided by 273. And this is going to give us our new volume, which should be bigger, right? It should be bigger than 105. So 105 times 336 is 35,280 divided by 273 is equal to 129.23. I'm just going to say V2 
equals 129 meters. All right, 129, that's a little more than 105, which is what we expect when the gas is expanding, um, when it's warming up, okay? So we are increasing the volume. Hopefully everyone followed the math of that problem. Again, if you're having trouble, read the book, practice the problems in the book, come see me for help, talk to your classmates, etc. okay? So section 1.3, now we're moving away from math. So that's all the math for this chapter, all right? Uh, I know we really jumped right into it, but I have faith that you guys can pick it up and follow along, and if not, that you'll let me know. The net rest of the chapter is talking a little bit more about the different types of chemical particles, okay? So we talked that about matter being, that chemistry is the study of matter, of different particles that have volume and have mass, okay? But those different types of matter can be classified differently, not just by their state, solid, liquid, or volume, but by their consistency, whether they are pure substances or mixtures of substances, okay? So those are the two different classifications of matter. You have pure substances and you have mixtures. Pure substances come in two different flavors. You have elements, which are basically total, they're the purest type of substance there is. They're single elements, single types of atoms from the periodic table, okay? Um, and they're all totally uniform in their structure. And then you have compounds, which are also pure substances. They are, a compound is a molecule, it is a substance that is made of a common, from a combination of different atoms, okay? So water, for example, H2O, there's one oxygen with two hydrogens attached to it, okay? But each, of, but water molecules are all the same. You can have, water is a pure substance, because it's a bunch of water molecules. All of the compounds are exactly the same, and it's all just that one type of compound, even though the compound is made up of different types of atoms. That makes sense. So elements, compounds, those are the two different types of pure substances, okay? Mixtures are when you have a, a mixture of different types of elements or molecules or compounds together in a mix, all right? And there's two different types of mixtures you can have. You can have a homogeneous mixture or a heterogeneous mixture. So I'm going to talk about these a little more on future slides. All right? So mixtures are combinations, these two different, so a homogeneous mix. Homo means the same, okay? Homosexual, two people who like the same sex, the same gender, okay? Homogeneous, the same through, it, as a mixture that is the same throughout. It is very sort of evenly distributed, all right? Some examples of homogeneous mixtures, air, okay? There's not like, if you take this classroom, there's a bunch of oxygen, hydrogen, nitrogen in the air in this classroom, but it's not like the oxygen's over here and the nitrogen's over here. It's an even mix. All of those gases are mixed evenly distributed throughout the room. Um, Certain metals, different like metal alloys, brass being one. Salt water. You take salt, you add it to water, you mix it up, the salt dissolves. And it is, an, it is a, a clear solution. You can't see, you know, salt globules everywhere. It is evenly distributed into the water. So it is homogeneous. A heterogeneous mixture is not uniform. Oftentimes you can see particles floating around, okay? So... Vegetable soup, I like that example. So you mix in some green beans and some corn and some beans and some noodles maybe, okay? You can see them all discreetly. They're not, even if they're evenly distributed, they're still separate. You can see them in this, uh, in the solution, but, and they're probably not totally random. You know, there might be a clump of some corn here and stuff like that. So um, heterogeneous mixtures are... You can see the different particles. They're not actually dissolved and in, in together. All right. Um, some talking about pure substances, going back and re reviewing that, what I said about pure substances. Elements are the simplest type of matter. You can't break them down really into anything more. They're atoms in their purest form. So oxygen, neon, basically any element off the periodic table. 
is a pure substance. Compounds are made of two or more elements of different atoms that are combined together chemically. So they still form sort of a, um, a pure substance of that type of molecule. Okay? And we used the example of water before, but some others are salt, glucose. These are all combinations of atoms to make molecules, to make compounds. All right, so a little practice of this. Um, of this topic. <laughs> Classify each of the following mixtures as homogeneous or heterogeneous and briefly justify your answer. A, olive oil, homogeneous or heterogeneous? Yes, homogeneous. It's, a, it's an even solution. You can't see little particles and there's lots of things in there. It's not, olive oil is lots of different chemicals mixed in. It's not an element or it's not a pure substance, but it is a homogeneous mixture. Chocolate chip cookie dough, homogeneous or heterogeneous? Heterogeneous, yes, because you've got this cookie dough, which, you know, all the flour and water and stuff mixed together. Then you've got all these little dots, dots of chocolate chips hanging out there that are easy to spot, so it's not an even sort of, same, it's not same throughout, all right? And then in terms of these, part B here, um, which is a mixture and which is a pure substance? So A, cake batter, is that a mixture or is it a pure substance? It's a mixture. That one's a little more obvious. It's not elements or compounds. It's a lot of different things. It's flour and water and eggs and sugar all mixed together. It's a mixture, okay? How about helium gas inside a balloon? Is that a mixture or a pure substance? It's a pure substance. Which type of pure substance? Is it an element or a compound? Helium is an element. It's an element off the periodic table, okay? So it is a pure substance and it happens to be an element, all right? Speaking of elements off the periodic table, here is a picture of the periodic table. This is the one that's provided by your book that's in the inside cover of the front cover of your book and will be very valuable to you for the duration of the semester. It is your new best friend, as I say here on this slide. Um, it is an arrangement of all of the elements that are known in nature and have been chemically synthesized for that matter. Um, and it has a unique arrangement that we'll get to in, in future chapters, talk more about in detail. Um, but some things I want you to know about, about the periodic table is some of the terminology associated with it. So we have all of the elements are arranged, uh, are color coded here based on their group, whether they are metals, non-metals, or metalloids, okay? So most of the elements are classified as metals. Basically everything on the left side of the table is a metal, blue, except for hydrogen. Hydrogen is a non-metal that happens to live on the left side. All of the non-metals are in yellow. Then you have the metalloids, which are sort of along this like staircase bold line here, um, that are sort of in between the metals and the non-metals. They have some properties of metals, some properties of non-metals. Other thing you need to know about the periodic table is that um, it's divided into, we talk about columns of the periodic table and rows of the periodic table. A lot of times we talk about the columns, we refer to them as groups. A group is a column on the periodic table. And you can see that here, they're labeled group one, oops, group one, group two, group three, they're talking about columns. When we're talking about rows, we refer to them as periods, a period is a row, okay, and we refer to groups more often than we refer to periods, but there's a little terminology you should know there, all right? So a little bit more about compounds. So those are the elements, that's the periodic table. Compounds are fusions of different atoms from different elements that are chemically joined together, okay? And they are represented by a chemical formula. So most people know water is H2O. The chemical formula of water is H2O. That is indicating that there are two hydrogens and one oxygen molecule or atom in a water molecule. So one water molecule is one hydrogen or one oxygen and two hydrogens all chemically fused together to form this compound, water. 
and H2O is the chemical formula. So on a previous slide, I had shown you glucose, and in parentheses, I had written C6H12O6. That's the chemical formula for glucose, that there are six carbons, 12 hydrogens, and six oxygens in one glucose molecule in that compound. All right? So when it comes to chemistry and matter and studying matter, there are different types of changes that can occur um, that we talk about. There are both physical changes and chemical changes, all right? And we will learn a little bit about both. Physical changes are important. That's talking about changing from one state of matter to another, oftentimes. So taking an ice cube, a solid block of water, melting it down to a liquid water, and then steaming it to vaporized gaseous water, okay? All the time, we're still working with water. We haven't changed the identity of the matter. We haven't changed the identity of the substance. We've just changed the physical state that it's in, okay? So those are physical changes. Some other physical changes, um, taking a banana and cutting it into slices, okay? You're not changing the banana. You're just changing the shape of it or, or blending it, mashing it into some kind of puree, all right? It's still a banana. You haven't changed the chemical, any of the chemicals makeup of it, the identity of it. You've just changed the physicalness of it, the physicality, okay? Chemical changes, on the other hand, are when matter undergoes an actual chemical reaction to change into a different substance or different substances, right? And there's a lot of examples of this. Cook, there's a lot of cooking examples of this. Baking a cake actually undergoes, a, there's a chemical reaction that changes it from the liquidy batter into that fluffy cake-like substance, okay? You can't then take the cake, put it in the refrigerator, and cool it back down to the batter, okay? Because chemical changes occur during the heating process that change it, that cook it into a cake. Another example is combustion of fuel in your car. Um, in the, within the engine, fuel is burned to form carbon dioxide and water, okay? You can't really reverse that in the engine. That's a chemical change. The, the chemistry, the, mole the fuel molecules are actually being changed. They're going from fuel to carbon dioxide and water. All right? So when a chemical reaction occurs, we can express this as chemists, as scientists, in the form of a chemical equation. It's like a sentence or a math problem that explains what happens in a chemical reaction. So you need to know sort of the basic parts so that you can understand them because you'll see a lot of chemical reactions in the textbook in, in chapters to come. You need to understand what a chemical equation is. So a chemical equation, again, it's like, it's like a sentence that says what happens in a reaction. So for example, this is the chemical equation for charcoal burning in oxygen to produce carbon dioxide. The chemical equation for that is carbon, the, el the elemental symbol for carbon is C. Um, plus oxygen, and then this arrow here is called the reaction arrow, okay, and it's converted to carbon dioxide. Everything on the left side of the equation are the reactants, okay, and the reactants react to form products. So everything on the right side of the equation are products, okay? Um, and that's basically the a basic anatomy of a chemical equation. You have reactants, reacting to form a reaction arrow, and then you have the products. So the last thing to sort of note about, about this is um, these little letters in parentheses next to the chemicals. What do you think those, those are, that those stand for? Right, it stands for the state of the matter. So S for solid, L for liquid, G for gas. So basically it's saying that this carbon is solid. Charcoal, a charcoal brick, is solid. Um, oxygen, gas, oxygen in the air is gas, and it's con you react these two things. In the presence of heat, a lot of times heat is just, um, if, if, some, if like the conditions of a reaction, sometimes will be written over this reaction arrow, okay, so you're heating these reactants, and you get this product, carbon dioxide, which is a gas. So, um, that is a chemical reaction. And that is the end of chapter one. 
So um, if you have any questions, I should be hopefully in the classroom in front of you right now. You can ask. Otherwise, rewatch the lecture, read the book, come to office hours, do the homework. Not necessarily in that order. Um, the end. Turn it off now.